welcome tonight to a conversation with author and, a and NYU graduate David Randall. Uh, his book, Dreamland, Adventures in the Strange Science of Sleep is getting lots of attention, it's selling well, it's being reviewed widely, it's getting a lot of publicity, and in addition to all that, it's an excellent book. Um, one night, not long ago, a man found himself collapsed in a hallway, clutching his leg like a wounded bear. As his curses and howls echoed through the walls of the, his apartment on an otherwise silent Tuesday night, a thought passed across his brain. Something had gone wrong. It was, after all, midnight. It was after midnight. He was not supposed to be in this position, on his back, on a hardwood floor, and he was definitely not supposed to be in this much pain. He lay there, hurt and confused, not knowing what had happened, since his last memory was laying his head down on a pillow in the bedroom 30 feet away. I give you the man. <laughs> David Randall, that's the first lines of his terrific new book. And he starts it off in a very conversational way, a very engaging way, in a way that I like to think that we taught him how to write here at NYU. He continues on and goes into uh, a neurologist's office to try to solve his problems with uh, sleepwalking, uh, but he's not satisfied. And in good journalistic fashion, he decides to go out and report. And he said, he walked, I walked out of the neurologist's office with more questions than answers. As I headed home, wondering if I would sleepwalk again and how badly it would hurt if I ran into something the next time, my confusion gave way to a plan. If my doctor couldn't tell me more about sleep, I reasoned, then I would go out and search for the solutions myself. A third of my life was passing by, unexamined and unaccounted for, and yet it was shrouded in mystery. So began my adventures in the strange science of sleep. So this is a book in a, in a very uh, interesting genre of both an uh, investigation and an adventure an exploration and a quest, and it brings together all of these elements uh, in beautiful writing and uh, very fine reporting. So I'm delighted David's here, and I wanted to ask you, uh, basically, so we know roughly how the book starts, tell us how you started in journalism and how you started and bring us up to the point where you came up with this terrific idea. Sure, and thanks for showing up, thanks for having me. Um, so I came to NYU, I started in 2005 in the, the master's program. Um, I had never published anything before. Um, I went to college at University of California in Riverside, which is kind of about 60 miles east of LA. Um, I was an English major, poli-sci major. It was kind of the, am I going to law school track or not? Um, so I waited two years, um, didn't obviously, came here. Um, and I think the first place I ever wrote for and got paid to write for was the Times. Um, they used to have the city section, which was this great place to try to write quirky stories um, about New York. So the first thing I wrote about we we're talking about was uh, about this giant anchor that's in front of this house in Park Slope. And I talked with the guy who owned the house and he said he, he got it for um, like four or five bottles of whiskey off of Cape May, New Jersey. And it was just kind of the, the story behind that. Um, so then I graduated here. Um, I interned for the Times. Um, that turned into stringing for them. Um, that's what I was doing pretty much full time um, for about a year. Um, covering fires and then at the same time I was doing I used to have this column called ink which was on Tuesdays and it was about 500 words and I it was a slice of life kind of feature and I thought of it as here's a chance to kind of do reported comedy so I did things like um, why do people without dogs go to dog parks um, uh, pigeons that live in the Staten Island Ferry Building um, New York's only unicycle club and that they meet at Grant's tomb um, and then a copy editor it was a great that Q, who's writing that, who's at Grant's tomb, and it's a unicyclist, which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, and then I got a job at Forbes. Um, this was 2006, 2007, um, because A, I liked the idea of health insurance, um, and B, it was just kind of a, a way to do something else. Um, so I was there for a couple of years, and now I'm at Reuters um, doing business journalism. And when you were at NYU, you were among the first uh, group to be in the portfolio program. Yeah. And the portfolio program was the precursor to the literary reportage concentration. And in it, uh, people would apply after having uh, been accepted here and come up with a, a project to come up with a beat of some sort. 
and develop a body of work around that. And, and I, I was trying to remember exactly what you were writing about. Uh, mine was Parks. Parks, that's right. Yeah, so I actually had my thesis project, whatever we called it back then, published. Uh, it was about the Parks program. They had this thing where they were going to um, have a tree census and count every tree in the city. Uh, and I wrote about it for both New York Magazine and The Times. That's right. That's right. You wrote about the, the, the cash value of a tree. Yeah, exactly. How much does a tree uh, improve values in a neighborhood? Yeah, if you can look at the tree out there and say, oh, that's worth $700 a year, mm -hmm. which seemed this weird mix of environmentalism and, I guess, Bloombergism of everything has a dollar value. Right. And what was it that about parks that drew you, and why, why did you start writing about that? Uh, part of it was um, the Times wasn't really covering it, I thought. So I thought, there's so many parks, there's got to be stories there. And that's where everybody, you know, sort of the people are to a certain extent. Um, and it's just kind of fun. You know, it's, if I live near Prospect Park, and any weekend you can see, um, you know, people from the West Indian community, you can see goofy people, you know, acting like they're playing, like hitting swords like, with each other. Um, you can see people uh, with gigantic kites in the air. You can see babies. You can, you can just see anything. So it seemed like the easiest way to find stories. I mean, I remember you were always, and I've, I've said this to my classes before about you, you were very canny, and I mean this in the best sense, you were very good at sort of figuring out the kinds of stories that various publications and the various sections within publications were looking for, and then sort of using that as kind of a schema, then going and finding those things. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, part of it was I didn't have, you know, I didn't go to, to an Ivy League place. I didn't, I didn't know anybody. Um, so one thing I'm, I'm happy with, I kind of, I walked through the front door everywhere I went. I didn't, there was no, oh, I, I know this person who knows my uncle who knows that. Um, so I thought, you know, how is the Times going to trust me to give the space? You know, I'm nobody. Um, so I have to do something that I know that they're going to want. So I can do that first and then kind of build to, hey, I think this other story is even greater. So once they trust me. Mm -hmm. So that was the way you would sort of climb up the, yeah, the exactly. greasy pole in that way. Yeah, and also just seemed like that's a story I would want to read there or, um, you know, it just seemed like it would fit. You know, I have friends who, who, are, who are screenwriters in L.A. and write for TV shows and everything else, and they kind of told me it's not, you know, that you have the most amazing idea, it's how you present the most amazing idea. Because everybody, it's so easy to say no. You just want to make somebody's job so easy that they can't say anything but yes. And has, has, has this original way of coming up with ideas, how has that helped you along? Have you used the same sort of thing at Reuters and the same sort of ideas at, uh, at, at uh, Forbes? Yeah, so it was not, when I was at Forbes, um, I didn't know anything about business. Um, I literally, when I started, didn't know the difference between a stock and a bond. Um, and I was honest with them about that, and they were like, oh, we can teach you, which was kind of nice about the old model of Forbes magazine. It was, you know, it's gonna, we're going to teach you. You're going to have to fact check, but that's a way to learn. Um, and this was also back when they had money. Um, you know, when I started, it was almost feeling like you got to the party five minutes before the alco all the alcohol dried up. <laughs> so when I started, the Forbes family literally paid for us to go on like a booze cruise on their private yacht around the city. And I got stuck in the corners talking with Steve Forbes about the election. Um, yeah. <laughs> I remember him saying, oh, you know, Obama's going to be tough for us to beat. And I was thinking, us. <laughs> um, so, you know, I had to find a way to, to get in the magazine because, you know, if you didn't get in the magazine, there wasn't a, you weren't going to get more money. Now, as I understood it uh, in, back in the day at Forbes, you would be hired as sort of a researcher, or reporter, yeah. and you would fact check part of the time, but then if you got a clip, you would then get an automatic promotion? It was if you had, there was this point system. Ah. So if you had more than like 15 points, you got promoted. Um, and then there were these kind of legacy people who literally wrote two stories a year about something like investing in candelabra or something. So they were kind of the first to go and, uh, out of the many waves of layoffs that we then went through. Um, but so it was nice. I had to find out what, how can I get in the magazine, and I decided, hey, I know about I know about music. Um, so I started writing about the entertainment industry and the music industry. So one of the first really big stories I did was a four or five page story on on uh, music festivals. So I went out to Coachella and outside of LA, um, got to go for free, it was fun, um, hung out backstage. Um, and then I kind of, then the financial crisis hit and I kind of quickly learned everything about finance and wrote more about that. Um, started doing fund manager profiles, which was, it was just fine. Um, and that's what I do a lot at Reuters too. And I kind of realized, you know, I, I kind of find the whole idea of trading and Wall Street kind of 
uh, that's not really interesting to me, but I realized, okay, here's fund managers. They're investing for the long term. They're thinking so much about what is the world going to look like in six months, two years, five years. They're thinking so much about it that they're betting on it. You know, they think, okay, so incomes are rising in China and people are eating more like their Western counterparts. You know, there's more KFCs and everything else. Well, that probably means obesity is going to rise. That means diabetes is going to rise. So maybe I should invest in diabetes drugs that are going to China. Um, or, you know, I talked with another fund manager, and this was after the tainted uh, baby no. food scandal. Oh, yeah. Um, in China many years ago, and he was saying, okay, so Chinese are scared of their own companies, basically. Well, they trust Japanese companies because there's a, a bigger track record there. So he was buying Japanese companies that made baby formula. So it was just kind of an interesting way to like, oh, let's connect every, all the dots. Um, you know, coming from just kind of thinking of everything in news terms, it was a way to, hey, here's a way to apply the news in a different way. This is what the readers actually do with it. Mm. Um, so I, I find that interesting. It's a way to kind of to do it, and um, it gives me a nice, to a certain extent, day job that I can work on the book. I'm working on my second book now, mm -hmm. um, and it gives me a nice kind of work-life balance. Okay. Well, tell us now about how you how you came up with this idea, how you did your research, how you developed the project, and and, and sold it. Okay. So when I first of all, it just came about because I wanted to. This is the book I wish I was out there when I started sleepwalking. Um, I walked into a wall, hurt myself. Doctor told me he couldn't. He didn't know anything about sleep, and science doesn't really know much about sleep. So that's kind of the premise. Um, so then I went out to Barnes and Noble, Amazon, looking for, hey, where's that great book on sleep? Where's the Mary Roach book on sleep? Um, and I just didn't find it. So you know, the sleep books I saw were written by sleep doctors, and most of them, you know, were written in bullet point style, which was kind of designed to not be read. Um, so I decided, hey, I'm going to look into this myself. Um, so I started thinking, what would a good sleep book look like. So, you know, just mentally make those kind of Venn diagrams. And one of them was Mary Roach, who, um, if you haven't read what she, she had, Stiff, which is her most popular book, um, was about the, what science, the weird ways science has used cadavers in research. Um, her most recent one was about the science of sending people into space. She's had other ones on the science of the afterlife and the science of sex. So it's just kind of right, it was popular stiff, science. Bong, what was the... Uh uh, spook. Spook, that's right, that was the And then Packing for Mars. Ah, uh -huh, right. Packing for Mars was, was the one that did least well because it had the most words in the title. Yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. More, more <laughs> ink, too. Yeah. <laughs> more cost. Um, so, and she's she writes in a funny, popular science way, like very engaging. Um, so I thought, okay, that's, that's a kind of good model for this. Um, and then as I was going into the book, too, I was like, okay, I can't, can't be that jokey for that long. I'm just not that funny. Um, <laughs> So what other kind of Venn diagram can I bring in? And you know, the other one that made sense as I started doing the research more too was, okay, sleep impacts how we learn, how we make decisions, all these other kind of cognitive process, processes. Um, who's really good at that? And this was kind of before he blew himself up, but Jonah Lehrer was really good at that. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell was really good at that. So okay, how can I, I can get that other part of it too? Um, and then the third part was, you know, Bill Bryson is just really good at explaining everyday life, um, kind of taking us through things in a kind of folksy, nice way. Um, it was the last book, I think just taught, went through like the history of everything in his house, <laughs> like beds and stairs and doorknobs and everything. Um, okay, that's a nice, that's the third circle. So if I can find something that hits all of that and I can write it in that way, well, maybe somebody will actually read it besides like my mom. So that was, I'm sorry, but that was the third circle after you decided to write about sleep or when you were looking for a book to write about? When I was, so I decided to write about sleep because I couldn't find the book I wanted to write, mm -hmm. read. So then when I was going through the propo proposal thinking, what kind of book am I going to write? Um, those were the kind of circles right. I was mentally had in my head. Um, and then it kind of went to finding an agent. Um, so you wrote a, a draft proposal. Yeah, and it was terrible. It was terrible. Yeah. And, it, and send it out to many agents, one agent? Uh, just one, actually. Um, so I started going through, again, just books I liked. Um, I'm a big believer in whatever you like, just keep going with it because you kind of are an expert in it to a certain extent. Um, so I realized there was this book, um, uh, In Dog We Trust. It was basically about why we like dogs, the, mm -hmm. the American dog culture. Um, then Ginny Lee wrote her Fortune Cookie Chronicles book. Um, Sasha Eisenberg wrote The Sushi Economy, like what does sushi mean? 
Um, and I was looking through these books, and you know, the acknowledgement sections in the back, they tell you who edited them, who, who was the agent. Um, and Larry Weissman, who's now my agent, um, he edited all three, agented, sold all three. So I, e you know, I found his email address, I emailed him. Um, we met in a coffee shop in Brooklyn. Um, we met for like 20, 30 minutes. We got along really well. And I just said, you know, what's the next step? He's like, well, do you want to work with me? And shook it, took out his hand. I was like, all right, and we shook hands. Um, and then the funny thing is, and I live in Park Slope, we're walking back to the train. I was like, oh, I live in Park Slope, where do you live, blah, blah. And he turns out he lives on, on Fifth Street. And I was like, I live on Fifth Street. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm 566. He's like, I'm, I'm 568. We're literally next door neighbors. <laughs> so I, he was always that guy walking his dog. I just didn't know who he was. And now he's my agent. Mm -hmm. I can see his, his living room from my window. So it's a very small world. <laughs> so you can go up to him and say, why isn't it selling better? Why, why aren't you doing exactly. more? Exactly. Like, he just leaves things on my door, doorstop. You know, I move his car for him. Well, you know, wow. Very small world. <laughs> wow, wow. So, OK, so uh, you send him the proposal, which you say wasn't very good. What happens then? So this was, um, this was December 2009, 2010, I want to say. Um, and he gets it, and he's like, this is a great idea. Let's work on the proposal. It wasn't terrible. I mean, I had a lot of it there. I just had it in the wrong order, basically. Um, so he's like, OK, let's work on this over the holiday break. Nobody's working for the next two weeks anyway, or three weeks. So it was right after Thanksgiving. And let's come back. Um, so then we started sending it out um, early January, middle of January. Um, and we met with five different editors, and one of them was Jill Bailoski, who was Mary Roach's, is, is still Mary Roach's editor. Um, and thankfully, it, it worked out that I, we went with her. Um, one of the editors I met with was also the editor of Obama's Dreams for My Father, mm. which was terrifying, mm -hmm. because you always think, oh, this is good, it's no Obama. You, know? <laughs> so you don't want that in the back of your, head, your editor's head at all times. Um, so then we went with that, and we signed the contract in February 2010. And How much work did your agent push you to do on the uh, proposal? So he said I had come to him much later in the process than most people. Um, also, the same thing was he, most of the people he worked with had been you know, recommended by one of his other clients or somebody else he knew. Um, again, this was me just kind of walking in through the front door. I, it was a blind pitch. I didn't know him whatsoever. I saw him all the time. I didn't know it was him, though. Um, so he said I was, I remember him saying I was 85% of the way done. Um, because I had done, I had already written a sample chapter. I would already done a bunch of reporting. I already knew roughly what all the chapters were going to be. Um, it was just the, the order was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had like a two-page thing in the beginning where it should have been a 20-page argument. So it was, it was too much of a... It was too condensed. Mm -hmm. I just had to kind of spell it out, all the points I was making throughout the book. I just had to kind of do it into what you kind of think of as an executive summary mm -hmm. or something. Um, so that was the biggest thing I had to do. But the sample chapter was pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. He's actually much working much more with me on the second proposal because it's outside of the science realm than the first one. So take us through the, 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 the book, the reporting and the organizing and the writing of the book sort of soup to nuts. All right, so when I, th when I was thinking about doing the book, I thought, okay, I'm just gonna literally draw a circle. How can I slice this in 13 or 14 different ways? How, you know, sleep obviously is something we all do. It affects all of us. How can I spell that out? Um, and I remember sitting at my desk thinking, okay, uh, how does the military deal with sleep? You know, they gotta sleep somehow. Like, it's gotta be hard if getting shot at. And so I was like, okay, military. Um, another one I thought, oh, Sports, okay, sports. So it's very, you know, rudimentary, like, oh, sharing a bed with somebody else or having a kid, you know, very basic. Um, and then after I, I we sold the book, um, that's when I kind of freaked out. It kind of mm -hmm. became real. Yeah. Um, I remember it was like a month or two after we sold the book, having this big freak out thinking, holy shit, this is real. You know, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm going to have to repay all this money. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> and... I kind of then realized, okay, I have to, I have to do it. Um, so why, why, what was the, other than the psychology of realizing it would actually had to be written, what, mm -hmm. was, what was behind this freak out, do you think? It just seemed overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, the longest thing I'd ever published at that time was maybe 1,200 words, and now I had a contract to write 80,000. And I was like, okay, that's a lot. <laughs> you know, um, and it just, I had never done it before, and I, I didn't know anybody who had written a book. Um, so then I started turning to, like, your book was great in terms of, 
you know, all interviewing people, what is your structure? What is your process? And that was the biggest thing was half, you know, it wasn't until June when I felt comfortable saying, I have a, just kind of a, a structure to what I'm doing. I, I have a, a, you know, when I'm taking notes, I know it's not just going to disappear because I labeled it the wrong thing in, in Word or something. I actually have something I can replicate 13 times. Mm -hmm. um, so then I, you know, Forbes, I was still working there, and Forbes was on, I think it might still be 12th and 5th Avenue. Um, you know so, who owns the building now? NYU. That's right. right. Yeah. Of course you do. <laughs> Just expanding. Um, so I would go, uh, the NYU library opens at 7, so I would get there at 7 every morning, um, and I'd work for three hours on the book, and then I'd go to work from 10 to 6, and then I'd go home and work more on the book. Because um, it was 2010, it wasn't a great time to say, hey, I want to have a book leave, um, because, like, okay, leave, you know, <laughs> just never come back. Um, so I was like, okay, I, I want to keep my job, I want to pay my student loans back, I want to do all those other things. Um, so then I had to do this, kind of force myself to say, you know, the first time you open up a, a blank document when you're working on a book, it's terrifying because you think, I have to fill this, and I have to fill so many more of these, and I don't know how. Um, so I kind of got myself in this corner in the library and just started going through. I was like, okay, what's, what's an interesting topic I can kind of go from right away that's going to have a lot of research out there? So I, I started with the military chapter. So I started going through, you know, I discovered what pub PubMed is which if you haven't written about science and scientific studies, it's kind of this clearinghouse for all scientific studies. So you can actually search by you know, sleep and couples, or sleep and the military, or sleep and decision making. And it becomes very, very easy all of a sudden. Because then you can find all the people, then you can email them, then you can call them, you can talk to them, you can get the actual studies. Um, so that's, that's what I started doing. Um, and then I also started finding out, okay, how can I talk with you know, actual people, get outside of the library? And that's when I kind of used the advantages I had from Forbes. So I went out to San Francisco to write a story about Charles Schwab, the company. Well, also out there, Stanford is a big sleep research uh, field uh, place. Um, UC Santa Cruz is too. Um, I went to another story to cover a company in San Diego. Same thing, I, I also found a way to do stuff for the book too. Um, every vacation became a way to also do things for the book. So it was almost always like, how can I, how can this hit two things? How does your wife they feel about this? She was happy. I mean, overall. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of every vacation being a work thing, everything. Well, the nice thing is we have family out there too. Oh, so okay. her sister lives in San Francisco. So it was okay. You want to drive out to Stanford to talk with about with sleep scientists all day? We're going to go to the beach. I was like, I think you're winning. <laughs> 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 and this and this thing, and then going out to San Diego. I was like, okay, I'm going to or L.A. Okay, let's go out to L.A. and you hang out of the beach and I'll go to the library. And she kind of had the better end of the deal. And you found, and, and so the kind of, you would just sort of let your imagination wander in terms of the kind of the searches you're doing online and then let mm -hmm. that lead you to experts and other sorts of people. Yeah, so, um, so I would, I make these gigantic Word documents. So I'd go through and just read every study I could find. And okay, is this interesting? I, I'll write whatever I could about it or, you know, paste it into this Word document. And then I'd, go through and read it and say, what kind of bubbles through the surface? What's enough here to, to actually be interesting? Um, you know, if I'm still interested in it a day or two later, if I remember the study after all the ones I've read, maybe it's something that's going to stay with you. Because um, I could always imagine, I could already like pre-imagine the, the reviews. Oh, this book about sleep is a real snooze. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's, you know, and it, it started being, it's hard too to think like, why, you start convincing yourself, why would anybody want to read about sleep? It's impossible to interview anybody because they're sleeping. And you can't get the kind of it's this absence of life. It's not an engaging part of life. So trying to find a way to make that accessible and not put you to sleep was, okay, how can I find the most interesting things? Um, so then for you know, the military chapter or the chapter, there's two chapter on dr chapters on dreams. The second one is about decision making and, and creativity and what dreams kind of do for us in terms of flexible thinking. and, and brain plasticity and, and all these other things, I had to think of like, okay, here's this very basic structure of the points I want to hit. Okay, and then, so I, I was going to bring a, a handout from this, but I wasn't able to for some reason. Um, so here's the very basic points. Okay, the next part is, here's the order I want to put them in. And then the next part of, okay, here's some actual <coughs> phrases and, and concepts I want to use. So it's always just a simplest, most simplistic way possible having this one kind of page roadmap 
So then if I was in the middle of it and thinking... Well, one page roadmap per chapter? Or per, per, per chapter. chapter, I see. Um, so it was, you know, key points, very basic structure, and then kind of the same basic structure, but with some concepts added to it. Um, so that way, if I ever got lost, I knew exactly what I was doing. Or, you know, a reminder at the top two, this is what this chapter is about. So it wasn't, okay, I don't want to repeat myself. I don't want to, okay, this chapter is also like that chapter, which is also, you know, five is like eight, which is like two. You know, you want to say, you know, chapter two is about chapter two. So, so you went, went through there, so you didn't have a sort of master outline as much as sort of a series of small outlines. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the thing. The, I mean, the way my book worked, you could read chapter two or chapter 10, and it doesn't necessarily matter what order they're in. Um, the, or, the only order we really came up with was kind of let's take you through the story of a night. So the first chapter is kind of the history of sleep, the history of the night, what happens as you're falling asleep, and then kind of goes into the deeper and deeper parts of sleep, and then the last chapter is about you know, natural ways to, to sleep well. It seemed like the most kind of obvious overall thematic structure, um, but then it didn't really matter beyond that. It's not like there's a character in chapter two that you are reintroduced to in chapter eight. Um, you know, when I did talk, when I did reference the same person more than once, I kind of, I, I glanced at that saying, as you might remember from blah, 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 but it didn't really matter. It wasn't like there's a through line or an arc or, or yeah, But it's things. very, you're very reader friendly in that uh, there are many points where you'll say, you know, such and such is topic, which you'll read more about in chapter, you know. Exactly, because I didn't want to paint myself in a corner <laughs> of saying, I have to explain all this right now. I want to show, like, I know that this is out there, you know, I'm not an idiot. Right. And, you know, just hold on. <laughs> You know. were, were there any, I mean, you went through a sleep study early on, which didn't really tell you very much. That was actually yeah. the inspiration for the book. Were there other sort of experimental stuff, first person things you did that uh, helped you with the reporting? I tried to, um, so I was trying to figure out in the beginning how first person it would be. You know, would this be like an A.J. Jacobs book? Who was, you know, he, one of his books was um, reading the entire encyclopedia. And what's that like? One humbles man, one man's humble quest to fill in the blank, whatever. Um, you know, one was like the year of li living biblically, and another one was, um, I think it was like trying to be the smartest man or, or some, right, some all those kind of things, kind of jokey. Um, or gimmicky. Yeah, gimmicky. So I didn't want to go <laughs> too gimmicky. Right. Um, so that was one chapter on dreaming I kind of took out. You know, lucid dreaming is this idea that while, you're, why, while you are dreaming, you realize you're dreaming, and then you kind of take control of it. So as opposed to being the actor, you're kind of the director. So you can say, hey, I'm, I'm dreaming I'm walking through the street. Wouldn't it be cool to fly? And suddenly you're flying. Um, so there's you know, a lot of people who really are into this and try it. And I, I tried it just kind of briefly, and I realized this isn't going to work. This isn't the same tone of the book I want to write. Um, the same thing, too, in the first or second chapter, I talk about how s studies show that naturally we, we wouldn't sleep in an eight-hour block. We're kind of primed to fall asleep around 10, then wake up around 2 and stay awake for an hour naturally, and then go back to sleep. So it's this idea of the first sleep and the second sleep. And when you're away from electric lights and artificial lights and all that kind of stuff, it becomes easier to do this. So it was the idea of, like, do I go to Montana and, and try to get away from it all and, and uh -huh. do this myself? Because um, you can't get that dark in, in Brooklyn. Um, but I was like, you know, that's just not the same, same book. Uh, it would work in another one, probably, just not right. the one I'm doing. Or maybe a sort of more experiential essay, memoir-like essay. Yeah. So, so it's interesting because I remember when you first told me how you came up with the book idea and you said, well, I have these sleep problems, and I thought, mm -hmm. oh, it's going to be not a memoir, perhaps, but to have yeah. a stronger memoir component, and yet it really doesn't, although the, you know, the through line and the, and the catch, the way it tries to catch you as a reader, mm -hmm. is very much about that. Yeah, so the idea basically was, okay, I knew nothing about sleep. I walked in, into a wall. It really hurt. I'm going to find out about sleep. I'm going to take you with me through this journey. You know, I'm not a sleep doctor, but I'm going to uncover all this kind of for you and let me take you on this cool trip. As opposed to, you know, it's not a self-help book. I, I try to put that, you know, very obvious in the, in the beginning. This is not the way to like find out 10 perfect ways to sleep. But maybe if you know about sleep, it'll be easier for you then to sleep. So maybe that's a secondary or tertiary effect, but the real effect is you're going to learn a lot about science, you're going to learn a lot about sleep that you didn't know, and it affects you in ways you didn't know. What was the most surprising thing that you learned in your reporting? Um, probably the, the sleepwalking killing chapter, which is right. the most fun to write, too. Yeah. Um, so there was this famous case in the late 1980s where this guy drove 14 miles to his house, and he was in the suburbs of Toronto, 
drives 14 miles to his, to his in-law's, in-law's house, house, in-law's yeah. house um, lets himself in with his key, <coughs> proceeds to stab his mother-in-law to death with a carving knife, almost kills his father-in-law, then drives directly to a police station and says, I think something happened. I think it was in an accident. Um, so at the trial the next year, he's on trial for murder, obviously. Um, his doctors and lawyers convinced the jury that he was sleepwalking the whole time, and he was acquitted. Um, so it turned out that he has this disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder. So when you're sleeping, your body essentially paralyzes itself. That's why you don't act out your dreams. For some people, this doesn't work. So you can do complex behaviors. Your, your eyes are open. You, you are doing all these other things. You could possibly be killing somebody. Um, so now this is a bigger question in the legal system, which basically sees all actions as either voluntary or involuntary. This might be semi, semi-voluntary. There are more and more cases. Um, there's a very similar case in Arizona. Somebody didn't drive, but he stabbed his wife 40 something times and then held, held her head under their backyard pool. And he was not acquitted. And he's in prison for the rest of his life, close to the Mexican border. So there's this idea of, OK, what's the strangest things our bodies can do? Um, and I talked to this professor at the University of Minnesota who all he does is, is research this. And he's researched and testified in over 200 cases by now. Um, and this this is the uh, Kramer Bornemann, the yeah, Colum- looked, Columbo of sleep crime. Yeah, he looks a lot like Johnny Cash. Like yeah. <laughs> very dark hair, very pale, <clears throat> prone to wearing black shirts with red ties. Um, it works. And, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it was just kind of this idea of, you know, how, how far away from what we think of as normal sleep can we go? Um, and it was just kind of one of those thought experiments, basically. Mm-hmm. And if, it's also for somebody who sleepwalks, it's kind of the sum of all fears. You know, what happened if I did? What would happen if I did that? Um, you know, so that's that's probably the, my one of my favorite chapters to write. Yeah. Um, the military chapter was a lot of fun too, because I did go down to Walter Reed, talked to a bunch of people in the military, um, and learned a lot about how it all works. Then I, I wouldn't know kind of the logistics of, you know, when you invade a country, what do you have to prepare for? Or when you have 300 people on a ship, how do you help them sleep? Or if you send somebody in a submarine and they're underground, underwater for three straight months, how do you make them not go crazy? There's almost all these things of, they know the limits of the human body more than anybody else because they push the limits of the human body. Mm. Yeah, I was stunned by that one statistic about one out of four friendly fire accidents are traced to sleep problems. Yeah, sleeplessness. Yeah. So basically, if you're not sleeping, you make terrible decisions. Um, and it's, it's easier and easier to shoot the wrong person. Um, and there's another statistic in there that during the invasion of Iraq, the longer somebody had gone without sleep, the more likely they were to have an altercation with a civilian. So it's basically a self-defeating prophecy. So you know we're going to we're going to push you guys harder to complete the mission, but be, by doing that, we're going to create more problems. Uh, uh. And uh, what was the editing process like with your with your editor? How heavily uh, I know books are sometimes much more heavily than edited than other books. How, how what was your experience like? It was I was pretty lucky. I was, I was very happy with it. Um, that's one of the biggest things, kind of the going from daily journalism or even you know magazine journalism to books is it's like oh here's here's a bunch of money. See you in a year. So it was, oh well okay this is it's kind of terrifying to a certain extent not having that that hand holding to a certain extent. Um, so when I sent it in, it was. March 1st of last year. Um, Jill and her assistant both read the whole thing, gave me line edits. Um, the biggest things were just kind of structural. Mm. So it's okay, here's, you know, chapter, what well, you have chapter as chapter 10, let's make that two chapters. Or let's do this. And it wasn't, you know, wholesale rewriting. It wasn't, um, you know, the line edits were, were just good. It was like, okay, this, this did make it better. And it, felt all like me the whole time. But they really engaged it, you felt. Yeah, it was. was yeah. I, and I, then I ended up talking to other people at Forbes who'd, who'd written books, and I, w- I realized how lucky I was. Yeah, because you know, I mean, the, you know, the editors tend, tend to as- assign or you know, acquire so many books. In any given season, you're publishing 8, 10, 12, sometimes you know, more books. Mm-hmm. There's no way you can line edit that many books. Yeah, I was, I was very lucky. And I, I know somebody <coughs> else wrote a book, and his sum total of his edits were like two pages. Mm. And they were just kind of conceptual. You might want to do this, you might want to do this. This mm. part's strong, that part's weak. This was, you know, I saw Jill's handwriting. I saw Allison's handwriting. Mm. Um, and it was, it was great. That's and, great. And I feel very, very lucky. I think that's one of the best parts about with Larry, too, is, you know, he, he, this is his job. He knows how to connect this person with that person um, to make the best product. And I, I can't say enough good things about either yeah. of them. 
And uh, uh, tell us a bit about your second book, and then I'll throw it open because I know people will have questions. Sure. So, um, you know, when you write a book about sleep, it's not like you can do the follow up of like the strange signs of being awake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, this was actually a book I was working on before I started sleepwalking. Um, it's going to be a narrative nonfiction set in California. Um, it's kind of an Eric Larson type book. Um, so, the basic story is that all of Malibu, the city of Malibu, was once a, a family's private ranch. Um, and it's the story of how they lost it. So the state basically wanted to build Pacific, what we now know as Pacific Coast Highway through the ranch. There were homesteaders. Um, and so the, when they moved out there, the, the family who ended up buying it, or owning the ranch, he was a, his name was Frederick Wrench. He was contemporary of Theodore Roosevelt. He was almost like a, a Rockefeller, you know, very blue blood. Um, he dies suddenly. His wife inherits the en entire thing, $800 million. Uh, empire basically and she loses it all trying to fight the state and kind of fight modernity coming through mm -hmm. so it's the story of you know how California was made how Los Angeles became the boom town you know the the death of the old west and the birth of Hollywood and everything else all set against the most beautiful place in the world oh, fantastic and are you from around there yeah so I'm from Riverside ah. um, so and I found it because you know some snowy day during like a blizzard or something I started looking up Pacific Coast Highway because I used to drive up and down it surfing all the time and I thought oh there's got to be a great book about it and again didn't find the book that's right you once told me you were gonna write a book about the Pacific Coast Highway yeah and, I thought, and that's what, the hell what is he talking about and that's what turned this was what it turned into uh -huh. because I started seeing this reference to Wrench. I was like what the what's this um, so I kind of sought out the remaining family members uh, I've talked with them. Um, they're giving me her diary, you know, financial records, all this other stuff, all these other things, um, and hopefully to make it kind of the big, sprawling, epic Eric Larson book. And has it been written about by scholars or by popular people? Or? It's been written in the concept of, in the context of an eminent domain uh -huh. because it did go to the Supreme Court because you know is the idea of, and it kind of it was a important Supreme Court decision too because. It was the first time that the Supreme Court said, we can take land just for aesthetic reasons. So it's not just, you know, we can take land for a hospital or school. Those are basic things or fort or something. That's basic use of eminent domain. Taking it for an aesthetic purpose is, is changing it. And it was kind of rooted in the idea of the city beautiful movement, which was turn of the century idea that, you know, it's kind of a reaction to urban life too, mm -hmm. that you know, people need to have access to beautiful things and that just kind of makes society better as a whole. Um, and then the, in this also case, it, it helped real estate um, brokers too, who donated heavily to many California politicians at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the, the concept I keep on going through as I'm writing the proposal in the chapter is what if you never compromised? You know, if you had so much money that you thought you could never compromise, and just kept on upping the ante, upping the ante, upping the ante, what happens eventually? Well, after 40 years, you go bankrupt. Uh -huh. So she died with $60 to her name, oh. and her handwritten will says to anybody who lays claim to my property, they can share $1. So it was just kind of this epic, epic fall of kind of the Citizen Kane, but this very strong female character, which I thought was fascinating. You know, there's reports of her riding side saddle across the Malibu canyons with a shotgun, like aiming and shooting at anybody who came onto her land. And it's just this great, great story. Because when you go to Malibu, you're like, oh, this is Steven Spielberg's house. You don't realize that 80 years ago, that's where bears were. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a very rugged, rugged terrain. It was, uh, it used to be a Spanish ranch, um, or rancho, when you know, Spain kind of carved up all of California. Um, in the 1850s, 1860s, Los Angeles was tiny. It was, there were more cows than people. <laughs> people were scared to be there because it was just so empty. And then within 100 years, it's completely different. It's the biggest mm -hmm. boom of a city probably ever. How do you how do you open the book? Um, so the first it's kind of the preface is um, these homesteaders who are you know they own land behind Malibu and they can't get to LA because May Ranch has blocked off the beach route, which eventually becomes Pacific Coast Highway. But you know they had horses and everything, um, so they know she's driving on her private road that she'd built. Um, so they're trying to barricade her. So they have this barricade. They have shotguns and everything, and they see her car coming. So it's kind of the, the start. Um, and then the then it goes into chapter one, which is Frederick and May Renge in the uh, a first class cabin of a train speeding west to Los Angeles during the, again one of the biggest boom real estate booms ever. It was the first real big boom 
and it was after uh, railroad. It was the first time railroad tickets were cheap enough for everybody mm. because the Southern Pacific had just broken the Santa Fe Railroad's monopoly in Southern California. So tickets that were $70 were suddenly $1. Wow. So it was this huge mass of people come in. And it was, you know, all the housing bust 2006, 2007, it was 10 times worse, you know, 1877, because banks were lending, you know, um, people were trading in options. There were no down payments to speak of and everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, why are they attracted to this boom? Oh, fascinating. Oh, I can't wait. Also with Norton? Uh, I don't know yet. We're oh, you're gonna, you're yeah, we're still it. selling it. Yeah. I think we're going to send it out next week or two weeks from now. Oh, well, so hopefully luck. it's with Norton. I mean, I have had a great experience. All right. um, their publicity department's great. Jill's great. Um, I can't complain. Great. And where it was on the extended bestseller list last week? or Yeah, it's been on two weeks, I yeah. think. So great. hopefully a third. Yeah. Buy like five copies each. each. Yes, right. Great stock yeah. and stuffer. And Helps you sleep better. <laughs> it's also going to be on the uh, in the New York Times book review in a few weeks, and it was already reviewed in the Science Times as well. So, yeah. so uh, questions? There's a microphone if you want to ask a question, whether about sleep or about writing. It doesn't matter. Can I do it with the mic? No, because we're, we're taping it. Oh, right. <coughs> Hi. Hello. Um, so where's your sleep at now? Um, so I had been sleeping pretty well, but I have a three-month-old baby, so that changes it's everything. Crappy, yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm very used to getting up at three in the morning now, but uh, overall I had, you know, I didn't go into the book thinking, I'm going to write about ways to sleep better, but you pick up things, obviously. So I was, I sleep pretty well. It's not like I, I never had a problem with insomnia. But are you still sleepwalking? Yeah, so it's drawn out. Um, sleepwalking, they, they don't know why, but there's two components to it. It's stress and then genetics. So I had to, I didn't realize I had the genetic part too. So I started working on the book, tell my dad, and he was like, oh, you know, I, I used to sleepwalk too. And he grew up on a farm in Kansas. And he told me stories, like, oh, there were several times I woke up in the cornfield. Like, that's, that's an alien abduction, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I think you convinced, that's what they told you, the sleepwalking. Um, but then stress too. So, um, you know, the third or fourth day after the baby was home, my wife woke up to see me standing in front of his bassinet going like this, like, I've got the baby, I've got oh, the baby. Geez. And thank God I didn't. <laughs> he was asleep soundly. I was sleepwalking. Um, you know, before I go on flights, it's easy. You can find me standing in front of my closet, like getting my bags out at three in the morning while I'm still asleep. I did that once too when I was yeah. a kid. But you do yoga and things like that. Yeah, that's what I, now, yeah. I don't do as much now, as much, yeah. sadly. But uh, that really helps. Um, yeah, yoga helps sleep because it helps Oh, you, you did it to help your sleep. Oh, no, not, I don't sleep yoga. <laughs> no, no, no. So I realize you can make sleep hyphen anything, verb. It, it, all, it all happens, sleep sex, sleep swimming, everything else. And have you, uh, this new uh, Mike Verbiglia movie uh, yeah. about Sleepwalk, what, Sleepwalk With Me? Sleepwalk With Me. Have you been, uh, was there just coincidence that it came out? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was just coincidence. I, I'd like to say we were that smart, but um, it just kind of happened. So that's why like, on Amazon, somebody wrote, oh, I saw him on The Daily Show when he was really funny. I bought his book. I was like, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I have been on TV, but not The Daily Show, right. unfortunately. Not yet, not yet. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Uh, so I think one of the things I appreciate about this is that you take something, like I think you said that we don't really think about very often or take for granted, like sleep, and have found like, all this interesting information about it. So I was wondering, and you tell your own story too, so have other people been coming up to you with like telling you like their own stories about their sleep problems mm -hmm. and like if they learned anything from your book? I mostly hear their strange sleep stories. Um, I don't hear, at least not yet, hopefully, hopefully I will, that oh, this the book helped me so much. But I do hear stories of, um, especially with Ambien and sleeping pills for some reason. Because in the book I talk about, you know, the way that these pills really work is they give you short-term amnesia. So you take it at 10, you wake up at 6, don't remember anything, you think, oh, I slept the whole time. Well, you, you were awake, your brain just didn't capture that into to memory. That's how the pills work. So they tell me stories about, like, oh, I, I walked out into my, my kid, uh, saw me in the middle of the night, and, or I woke up the next day and I went out to my kitchen, my kid was like, Dad, you were acting so strange. And he, this guy was saying, oh, you know, what are you talking about? And his son was saying, oh, you walked out and you had peanut butter smeared all over your face. <laughs> And then you got down in front of the TV on your knees and started praying. It like, looked like you were praying, then you went back to bed, and it was just this guy's crazy ambient story. And I've heard so many other crazy ambient stories. 
Um, and actually, when I was at a, a sleep conference, um, every year, like all the sleep scientists basically meet in one place. And that's what year I went to. It was in San Antonio. And I was just talking to the person who was checking me in. And she was like, oh, what you're doing? You're not a scientist, blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that she had so many sleep disorders and just happened to be working there. <laughs> <laughs> and she said she was sharing a hotel room with her brother one time. And he had just been back from Iraq or Afghanistan. And he was more scared. He said he was more scared of sharing the room with her than being in war because she kept on like screaming like a banshee and like running into things and everything else. And she showed me like her bruises. And so I've yeah definitely people talk. People want to share stories. I have a careerist question for you. Uh, what happens when you write a book that spends a couple weeks on the extended bestseller list? I mean, do you have editors calling you and being like, yes, I'd really like you to write something for me now? I mean, do doors open, or is it just sort of like, oh, I've got you know, a book on the bestseller list, and that's, that's nice? Well, so far it's still pretty recently, but um, yes, I have had people email me, call me up, and say, yeah, oh, we'd love for you to write for this, we'd love you to do that. Um, especially, you know, it's not only the, company, the places you would hope for, like the Times or Popular Science or something else, you also hear from very niche or tertiary publications. You know, something, this place in, in England I've never heard of emailed me and asked if they would, if I would write for something like their launch publication. Um, and I ended up not doing it just because I didn't have time. Um, but yeah, so, so, so far doors, some more doors have opened. Um, at work, I've been really lucky that my editor and and her editor and up the chain have been very supportive. Um, so they've given me time to, you know, hey, can, can I leave for an hour to go to NPR and come back? And like, oh, that's fine, you know. Can I come in 20 minutes late because I'm going to be on MSNBC this morning? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, so it helps, obviously. Um, but it's not like, you're, or at least for me so far, the world doesn't totally change. You know, you still have people editing you, you still get in arguments with the desk, you know, it's still, you still do your job. I just wanted to ask a question about journalism and the industry writ large. You've, had, you've worked for a number of different publications, and you mentioned how when you were talking to fund managers, you found it interesting how they use the news or the, the yeah. uses of the news. So you know, given that you were at Forbes where they were going through a lot of changes, what do you think about the Reuters funding model where they use like s special insider subscriptions mm -hmm. to breaking news for an extra premium and then they use that to fund a lot of other sort of journalistic stuff that would not necessarily have the same focus. But you know, they're a really well capitalized company that has yeah. an amazing funding model. What do you think of that in terms of the future of journalism? Or I think it's going to go that way. I mean, we if they do news people pay for, and I think to a certain extent, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people who pay for that extra five minutes or hour or whatever else, some of that they might have a computer model that trades based on, it just reads things and trades for them. They have an algorithm. Um, otherwise, they just, you know, that is more important to them. That's, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter if you scooped somebody else by two minutes for, for most publications. Oh, um, I don't know, something in the news, you know, the living ambassador <coughs> is, is dead. If, if the Times has that five minutes before the Washington Post, who really cares? Um, in business news, that does matter because you do want, you do trade the news more so. Um, so I think, I, I think that's good. You know, it's, it's a nice to have that long-term model. And Reuters is interesting because so much of it is a data company. You know, the news is almost like the cake topper. Um, the news is the reason why people keep coming back. They're doing so much in social media, not necessarily because that pays for itself, because it doesn't by any means, but it does matter that, you know, say the CEO of Bank of America or something else, he gets his general interest news from Reuters, so then he's not going to say, let's cut the terminals. They're, they're going to keep that business model going. And I think that's smart. I think that, you know, I, when I started going to, when I decided to go to journalism school, local papers were still kind of a big deal. And I thought I was going to write for a local paper or be like the local metro columnist somewhere. That's what I thought, like, my biggest dream would be. Mm. And they're all kind of going away. And, you know, I worked for the AP, too. And the AP kind of, you know, finds itself in this weird place that it, it's for newspapers, but newspapers are kind of going away. And the people won't pay for it, so they're almost finding themselves at a race to the bottom. Whereas Bloomberg and Reuters and Times and Wall Street Journal, they're kind of catering to people who still pay for news. And if that still disseminates 
to a wider place, the people base that doesn't pay for it, that's great. Just very, very briefly, but um, Felix Salmon, who, who yeah. works in your company, uh, had, had a very provocative... Not very far from me. Right. He had a very provocative idea where he said, well, you know, when, when the Times makes some you know, market-making, investigative, journalistic piece, maybe they should uh, just have a little business on the side where they, um, you know, tell people who would pay for that mm -hmm. earlier, and then they won't have any budget problems ever again. Yeah, Felix is much smarter than me, so <laughs> whatever he says, I agree with. No, but um, no, I, I, I kind of agree with that, too, that, you know, if you put it online, it's, it's fun. I know, I'm, I'm much, very much a believer that people should pay for news. That especially if you can find a market that will pay for news. I think of Huffington Post and many other places as, maybe I shouldn't say this because they won't want to write about me, but I think it's kind of stealing to a certain extent. I mean, I think it's, a lot of it's just bullshit. And I think there's nothing wrong with, if you're going to write about people dying in Iraq, that costs a lot of money. If you're going to write about tainted wells, that costs a lot of money, and that matters. Um, so if you can find money, that's pretty good business. I was wondering if... Um what do you think was the main reason that you got this first book contract, um, except for it being a very timely um, um, uh, topic that no one else had written about before and that you had been doing a lot of good stuff before? Um, why did they, um, why do you think, what, what was the main reason that they picked you to do this? Well, it's kind of like asking why did your boat go if you weren't if you didn't have oars. Well, it's kind of you had the oars, you know. It hadn't been written about. It was hopefully presented in a engaging way, um, and it just kind of worked. I mean, you can ask the same thing about you know why did this editor choose this story over that one? Just it, it happened, and I, maybe I got lucky. I probably did get lucky, um, and hopefully it was it was it was interesting. Well, but I think the answer to the question says that he. He developed an approach to it using other models, thinking about how similar subjects had been tackled. And I think part of the reason I was so happy David would come to talk was just that I felt that he approached the book in a very common sense way that is accessible to people two, three, four years out of a program just like this, using, I like to think, the skills that we taught him about yeah. how do you approximate a story, how do you think about you know, using something as a model, but then break from it in interesting ways, all those sorts of things. That's a better answer. <laughs> no, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I guess my answer was kind of flippant. Um, no, it was, I think I, I thought about it a lot. It wasn't, you know, I woke up one day and thought, hey, I'm gonna write a book about sleep. You know, I, I put a lot of work into it. I had, I had a finished chapter that looks very much like the chapter that's in the book. Um, I, I kind of, I, I put a lot of work in. Um, you know, not to, to toot my own horn too much, but one of the reasons why I think I've done reasonably well so far is that I, I feel like I kind of outworked everybody else. You know, it's hard to wake up every morning at 6 o'clock and get on the train and get in the, get in the library at 7 a.m. and stay there for three hours and then go to work and then when you're done, work some more and then work on the weekends. Um, you know, I had so many times working on the book, friends call me, hey, let's, let's go to the bar, let's, let's go to this great band is playing. And you, if you can say no, you can say, what's more important? Well, the book became more important than a lot of other things. Um, so I, I put the work in, and maybe other people didn't. That's the better answer. <laughs> uh, so it sounds like your book, you talk about your own sleep difficulties. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Um, I haven't read it. Um, do you think the book would have been as successful without that? Uh, you were talking about how you went after other models. I mean, mm -hmm. one book that came to mind is, have you read Proust and the Squid? No. Okay, it's about the reading brain. It's a scientist who's writing mm -hmm. about the reading brain, and she talks about her own uh, family's struggles with dyslexia. Uh, do you think the book would have been su as successful without that kind of angle of, I'm a person, this is an issue that affects me? There would have been less reason for me to write it. You know, it's not... In the first place, like kind of, here's an outsider who's not a sleep scientist wanting to write about sleep science. What's the what's the hook? You know, why why should we give you? Why should we trust you? Why should we give you any money to do this? Why should we, you know, devote people's time to doing this? Why should we give space in the catalog when there's all these other books? Um, yeah, so I don't think it would have worked if I hadn't been sleepwalking. Um, I wouldn't have found the topic in the first place. 
I wouldn't have been, I had that self-interest to say like, okay, how is this affecting me? I want to learn more about this. Because I realized too that, you know, working on a book, it's hard. I mean, it's, it's obvious, but it's, it's a very lonesome profession. And you have to convince yourself every day that this matters when you have absolutely no feedback. And you have absolutely no incentive to, to work on it as opposed to now, as opposed to five hours from now or five days from now. Um, so the sleepwalking and having that kind of personal topic, part of it, helped me want to do it more. Um, then hopefully it, it makes readers, it makes it accessible. Say, here's this guy who might have a problem similar to mine or um, something else, um, and makes me want to hang out with him, makes me want him to take me through this world. Um, I don't think I could have written it if I didn't kind of have that for kind of first person part. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, you talked about how there, in the book, how there are two different, basically, approaches to analyzing the dreams, how there's the Freudian and the pragmatic. Um, do you think that those same kind of approaches can be applied to why people do certain things when they're sleepwalking as well? That's a good question. Um, so basically, the idea that you act out, kind of, sit, act out emotional ideas and, and sleep while you're sleepwalking. That goes back very far. You know, it goes back to Macbeth, at least. Um, but that's not how they kind of they see it now. They, they see you sleepwalking as just acting out habit. It's much more you go through things that are common to you. So that guy who drove 14 miles, he drove to his in-laws all the time. He was on autopilot. Um, somebody else in the book I, I mentioned you know, went into a blizzard basically naked and walked through it like three blocks and woke up with frostbite because he was walking the same path that he was always walking the dog. Um, so I think it's, they look at it much more in terms of, let's not even look at like pragmatic versus emotional or, or thematic or anything else. Let's just look at it. This is a strange thing that the brain does and we don't understand why yet. Um, that was one thing that was kind of nice to write about the book is that so much of the science isn't settled yet. It's nice to be able to write a book and saying they don't know why. Mm -hmm. And it's, it just seems honest, you know, as opposed to saying one thing I, I fault some of those other books, um, kind of like the not Gladwell, because he does this, he doesn't do this as much as some other people who kind of want to be him do. They make these gigantic statements and just kind of say, like, this is writ law, um, mm -hmm. when they can't really back it up. <coughs> you know, it's almost like they reduce it so much that they're trying to push the argument that's not there. So I've tried to say, and be honest, you know, scientists don't know why. This is what happens. So most of these people tend to be men, but they don't know why. Um, and hopefully, you know, I can do a revision to the book in a couple of years, and I can fill in all those times. Mm -hmm. But as of now, it's still pretty open, and I kind of like that about it. Hi. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience as a grad student at NYU, and what you found useful, what you liked about it, and <coughs> just your overall experience, what you got out of it. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I really liked it. Um, it got me to New York in the first place, which is part of the reason why I wanted to come. Um, I, when I applied to NYU, I applied to, <laughs> I applied to nine law schools and one journalism school. Because I was thinking, like, I'm going to, maybe I'll go to journalism, but I'm mostly going to be a lawyer. And then I realized, like, I don't know any happy lawyers. So I decided not to do that. I came here instead. Um, Thank God we let you in. I know. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be in Midtown <laughs> Law Firm right now. I know. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so I had a good experience. I I had two classes with you, portfolio yeah. two times. Um, great experience. Um, other great professors. Professor Saren was really good. Um, Professor Kroger. Kroger. I actually didn't have a class with her. Oh, you didn't? Oh, no. we just moved portfolio together. Maybe yeah. That was it. Yeah. Um, professor. He used to be Professor Wolf was here, and Professor Norman was great. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had great experience. The first thing I had published was a school assignment or a class assignment. Um, Professor Saren said, "Let's go find just kind of relics of old New York, like billboards or anything else." Um, so actually, this was the second thing I wrote about for the Times was this um, old Gimbel sign. That Gimbel's used to be the competitor to Macy's. It used to be right across the street, kind of like the the low end version. Um, and there's still an old Gimbel sign painted like on 33rd Street. And it was just kind of this ghost sign. And mm. they're building a new building next to it. So the whole hook was, here's this new building, and kids in it will look out and see this gimbal sign have no idea what it is. Um, so that was a way to do it. 
Um, so I started, I started getting a lot of like, school assignments published, which was nice. Um, and then just kind of the nuts and bolts. I, I, I worked the whole time I was here too. I worked um, part time as an encyclopedia editor at Facts and File. So it was kind of fun. You know, I just read science encyclopedias all day. And so I learned a lot of kind of this baseline thing where I, I wrote about, you know, they would get, they would buy a bunch of old photographs from like World War II or something. And my job was to write the captions for them. Mm. So it was really, it was a great job. Um, and that's what I also did when I was, after I graduated while I was stringing too. It was kind of like the base thing I could do. And then I worked out a uh, agreement with them basically. So if the Times called me, I could just leave and go cover a fire or anything else. Um, but I guess one thing I learned too, and maybe I, I, I kind of realized this and I appreciated it more as I, after I left NYU, is that there were kind of seemed like there were two tracks of people who were here. Some people were here just, they really wanted to be in New York and somebody else was paying for it. And it was great, it was fun times. And then there were people who maybe were paying for them for themselves. And I was one of those people. So I was always thinking, how can I get a job? How can I pay this money back? You know, how can I get married? I am married, um, and how can I like keep a roof over my head and all these other things? So I was more, how can I? I want to work harder than everybody else, and I'm just a naturally competitive person. So I kind of spotted who I thought the other best people were, and I thought, how can I be be better than them, or what can I learn from them? And not in a, not like in a jerk way, mm -hmm. like yeah. you know, I just I want to I want to be good. And what's the best way to be good is you take on other good people. And I think, comp I think that's one thing I learned from New York is competition is good and incentives are very good. So I think, like, I guess that's one of the things I would recommend is find an incentive and find somebody you want to compete against and outwork them. But also don't be a jerk because those people are going to help you later in your life. All right. All right, David, thank you very much. Really oh, appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Good talk to you. Yeah.